All right. Now we're, we all have to make sure that we don't make any errors in our speech now that we're being recorded. <clears throat> all right. So uh, first off, um, just at least one or two yeses. Can uh, everybody see my screen okay? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. So one of the first things that uh, Wei Wen had requested is uh, roles and permissions. Um, now, here at WVU, we pretty much use most of the basic uh, roles uh, and permissions that were there. We didn't really do a lot of role customizations. We did add uh, some custom roles for routing so that we could get the proper sign-offs. Um, this is above and beyond the unit administrators. Um, we had location, radiation, and biosafety, different sign-offs. So um, I can go ahead and show you um, some of the basis of that. Um, what I'll go ahead and do is uh, go ahead and show you just some of the basis of some of our test users here. Um, so if we go ahead and look up, we've got a variety of different test users that we use, different test reviewers, uh, KCPI, COI, KC admin, so on and so forth. Um, so for those of you who are completely unfamiliar with IRB, um, essentially what uh, I'll do is I'll open up uh, KC admin, look at some of the membership roles that they have here. Uh, we have them as an you know, IRB administrator under, um, we have them as uh, the unit hierarchy as the very generic uh, unit of the university unit and then we have it descending the hierarchy that way they have access to pretty much anything uh, because the way we set up all our colleges and departments are under that original you know, five zeros and a one university. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we've got uh, basic things here. Really, IRB administrator is all they really need. We did add protocol creator for the purposes of some of our testing, although uh, specifically unless they need to be a PI, they really don't use protocol creator unless they're actually using the create protocol icon. Um, <clears throat> so we've got just some of the basis there. Um, 129 is <coughs> used definitely most often. Um, that's what we give to anybody who accesses our system that goes through training so that they can go in and actually create protocols. Um, most of the other basic, um, you know, KC um, PI, we have a training administrator, sign off, all these different test users. Uh, but one thing I will show you is some of the uh, custom roles that we did make. Um, and uh, I really would have liked to have our technical resource, Mike Brent, here on the phone. Uh, but it doesn't appear as if he's uh, able to, to take a call at this time. So um, <clears throat> hopefully you guys won't have any, uh, any technical questions above and beyond my skill set, but we'll, we'll see. That may remain to be seen. Um, so what we actually did, the, some of the ones that we um, actually did add are in the uh, workflow infrastructure, uh, KC workflow. And if I just go ahead and do a search for these, you'll see there are going to be a couple of different ones here. We have our different protocol location approvers for um, MBRCCs, our Mary Bab Randolph Cancer Center, uh, the Physician's Office Center, uh, UHA, Ruby, Chestnut Ridge, uh, the VA. Uh, all these different locations are different ones that their um, certain protocols will go through. Um, what Mike actually did was uh, yeah, yeah, that'll work. <clears throat> um, we're actually going to send Lilo to call Mike, see if she can get a hold of him. Um, but either way, what we did was is we actually had particular questions that were triggered within the questionnaire if they were marked uh, actually from a drop down as far as location goes. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you that specifically when we get into the questionnaire. But um, if somebody selected those particular locations, it would add a node in the routing of the workflow that once it left the unit administrator's hands, that it would next go to the location routing. So if they answered to, to include UHA or the, the Physician's Office Center or any of these other things, um, it would actually have to go to those particular sign-offs. And each person has a, a delegate. So for instance, with um, Physician's Office Center, if I go into it here specifically, you can see um, that there is an assignee. Um, his name is Ronald Pellegrino. So he's one of the people that are actually assigned um, to to fulfill this role of uh, a location sign-off to make sure that they're okaying the research to be, you know, uh, used at those particular facilities. Um, so those are some of the custom roles that we made. And um, I'm going to go ahead back to where we were here, uh, name stays, workflow. Uh, two of the other ones that we made uh, specifically above and beyond the location routing is we made the um, 
uh, IRB radiation safety officer and biological safety officer. Uh, the radiation and bio are two of the other roles that um, also we have those dependent upon if you answer yes to using biological um, agents, they will have to go through the biological safety officer. And same thing for if you're using anything that involves radiation, they'll have to go through the radiation safety officer. So those are some of the custom roles that we actually did create. Um, like I said, we created them entirely for workflow purposes and sign off. Um, so they've, um, they've worked really well for us. It's not something that we use very often. Um, the, um, the, uh, sorry, the uh, unit administrator is, of course, the, the most um, often used. And um, the, uh, that's pretty much in the basic you know, KC setup. So there isn't really more uh, as far as customization of roles that we've done uh, above and beyond what, uh, what I've just shown. Um, any questions uh, on the line about any of those uh, specifics or, or anything else that I should branch into? Mike, I had a question. So, sure. so when, you were, when you were setting up your reviewers, uh, did you associate them to a group? Oh, or did you yeah. go about assigning individual uh, roles to each reviewer person? Um, no, what we did was um, we actually developed uh, specific committees um, so I'll show you um, the committees here that we have. I'm going to go ahead and search. Um, so what we did was we have our two regular full board committees. One is called the gold board and one is the blue board. So um, within there, uh, I can essentially, I'll just go to view active here on the gold board and show you um, the different members. So what we did was all the different members that are listed in the study we have um, assigned here. Um, and what we actually did was some of these members are active, some of these are actually uh, alternatives. Um, but uh, we have them set up here uh, as well as the, the schedule and everything. Um, we didn't actually specifically go to the uh, person and assign them a role. Um, if we assigned them to this particular board, if they're ever assigned as a reviewer, the KC uh, program goes ahead and assigns them uh, IRB online reviewer role for as long as they actually need it. It's, it's a derived role given to them by the system. So uh, specifically with reviewers, we didn't need to, to give them any roles to provide them with the functionality um, that they needed. Now the one other thing that we did talk about doing is creating a custom role which we had actually developed this mainly for our uh, award staff um, <clears throat> as opposed to IRB, but essentially it was a generic viewer role uh, across the entire system that wouldn't have any editable functionality or anything over a protocol unless they were, of course, assigned a more advanced role. But by uh, basics, that they would be able to log in and view um, any protocol that exists in the system, which is actually one of our WV requirements. So it's not something that we've actually implemented yet. Right now, we're just doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, seeing as we're still in the middle of our slow rollout. Um, but that's the way we dealt with our, uh, our reviewers. So, uh, Mike, I have another question. Sure. Uh, how about the IRB officer? Do you put them into a group? Um, the, uh, the only thing that um, we had here, and I can actually go ahead and look up, uh, for instance, uh, Lilo, who is here on the call. Um, I can show you her rights. So her rights in the system under membership are she is uh, an IRB reviewer, um, she is an IRB administrator and an active committee member on protocol. Now, the IRB reviewer is not a required role. It's not anything that she has to be because, like I said before, it's something that the, um, the system will actually assign to her, which this is the active committee member on protocol. Once she is actually assigned to a protocol, the, the uh, protocol will um, show that, and as you can see, it's a derived role over here. So really, as far as having administrator rights for what they need, um, the uh, role 128, the IRB administrator role, does really everything we need it to do. Um, we haven't had any um, so far insufficiencies. Um, occasionally when we have you know, issues that are sort of special cases, we can go above and beyond that to something more like application administrator, but normally IRB admin is really all we need. So then um, if you do have six or seven officers in IRB office, then you have to do this person set up seven times, right? Uh, you don't have to. Um, you can make uh, custom groups. There, there are a variety of different ways to use the roles. Um, 
I'll show you, for instance, you have person, group, role, permission, or responsibility. And uh, essentially what that means is um, person, you can actually search for a particular person, and from within there you can assign them roles. Groups, you can actually uh, assign different roles to groups and then assign people to those groups as well. Now, we didn't really choose to do that because we really only have two IRB administrators. Uh, we have multiple people with those permissions because we do a lot of maintenance and everything, uh, but it really wasn't required of us to do it. But yeah, you can actually, it's, it's really up to you. You can go into those seven different people and assign them the role, or you can go into the group and assign that group seven different people. So uh, either way, um, it's, um, it's sort of you know, six in one, half dozen the other. Um, there are also ways to assign people to roles instead of roles to people. Um, there's really a lot of different ways. It's sort of a all roads uh, lead to Rome type scenario. As long as that person is associated with that particular role, uh, however you chose to go about it to get there is, is entirely up to the user. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, any other specific questions on, uh, on roles or anything? Did you have to do anything with the responsibility? Uh, no, we've actually never even used the responsibility. Um, the, uh, a lot of the details of that, and I'm just going to go ahead and click on it here while it's here. Um, I think the, it's, it's essentially the same sort of thing where I showed before, um, where I'd gone to roll and then let me get the workflow up. Um, it's, we're, we're actually utilizing that functionality, we just never use it to go through it. So for instance, uh, you know, the Physicians Office Center is one that I showed you earlier. Um, it, it shows different memberships, and I believe those to be uh, very much the, the same. But like I said, um, specifically we were never actually required to go through uh, responsibility specifically. So we've only ever used uh, permissions to customize roles, roles to add to people. People essentially assigned to roles in groups, we can add people or roles too. So. Um, a lot of different ways to get there, but uh, responsibilities, uh, we haven't had any need to even investigate that for any of our functionality. Um, all our desired functionality is, is sufficient with uh, the, the uh, four uh, other options and, and the identity piece. So, so a little while er earlier you, you showed us the custom role you built and, and you mentioned unit administrator. Is that, is that same as the IRB administrator? Uh, no, the unit administrator is, is the, uh, the, pretty much the department sign-off, um, and uh, that exists uh, essentially in the maintenance panel under uh, shared. Um, as you go down here, there is the um, unit administrator. There we go. And then by selecting this, we have the different people. We can either search for a particular person or unit, and actually up here to the right and create new is actually where we'll go in there. So for instance, if we go... WVU 123, that's our sort of generic uh, aerospace unit. We have our KCSP, which is our signature person. Um, it's our, one of our test users, of course. Um, but anytime essentially a PI is referenced under the unit number of WVU 123, and that's actually a COI or a PI, the way we have it set up, um, is that anytime that happens and a protocol is submitted um, based on that unit number, it will have to go through this particular person um, for, you know, for sign-off. Of course, if I pick a different unit, we have a wide variety of units here. Um, WVU04 doesn't have one. Um, WVU, let's see, 139 um, has an uh, individual named Tom Witt. So <clears throat> we have a wide variety of different things here. Um, if I just cancel and actually just um, go to Unit Administrator and just hit Search, it'll actually pull them all up. So you'll be able to see you know, all the different units, all the different sign-offs. Um, some people sign off on multiple units. Um, some units have um, you know, different, some, some units don't have any at all. So if we don't put them in there, it skips that entire node in the routing, and then it goes right to the next node. Location, if any. Uh, radiation and biosafety, if any. And if none of those nodes are required, then it will go directly from the PI to the compliance office. OK, thanks. Sure. <clears throat> um, one of the things that, um, and this is probably where our, our technical resource could help me a little bit more, 
Um, initially, how this was set up, um, it was always going to go PI, then unit administrator. That was automatically set up from KC. The customizations that we did were those extra steps in the routing. Um, uh, I believe that uh, we had the option to set them up in sequential order or parallel, essentially. So we'd have everybody sign off all in the same node, or we'd have each one individually. And um, we've gone back and forth a little bit about how we want to do it. Uh, the compliance office um, doesn't really mind either way. I believe they do it currently in parallel. We do it right? parallel right yeah, now. Yeah, they, they do it in parallel now. And so that actually may be something that we're going to change in the near future is going from sequential to parallel sign-off so that if there are six different people that sign off, it's going to send a notification to all six um, just directly and instead of doing it piece by piece. So it's something that we had um, debated on. It depends on how we decide to eventually customize the notifications and really um, how we really just want to do business here. But from what I gathered, um, it's more of a uh, just a basis of just some, some time to be able to do that. I don't think there's really any limitation in us being able to select that. But like I said, that would be really best directed towards our technical resource, um, Mike Brent. <clears throat> so. Um, any other questions on roles or permissions? Sounds like we're ready to go to the protocol. All right. <clears throat> All right, so uh, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the questionnaire, um, which uh, we did um, a few things on here. And I'm going to get my uh, cheat sheet uh, from uh, way when. That's the wrong one. Just make sure that I'm, I'm not cheating. OK, the questionnaires. All right, good. All right, so um, what we'll do is I'm uh, going to go ahead and sign in as myself here. OK, so we'll um, create a uh, dummy protocol here real quick. Now, one of the first things, and I show this a little bit um, with our, and this is where, of course, you'll select the lead unit or department. Um, if I were to select WVU 123, it's going to go through aerospace studies, which is our test user. If I select our generic five zeros and a one. It's just our university unit. It has no sign-off. Um, but um, one of the things that we did do, let me select myself here as the PI very quickly. Um, we designed the questionnaire to be directly related to uh, two different things. One is the protocol type. So we have uh, different protocol types here, CIRB, clinical trials, emergency use, exempt, expedited, full board, HUDs, and NHSR. Those are the different protocol types that we select. Um, here at WVU, and then the other piece is funding sources. Um, if somebody enters a funding source on this page, um, they will actually have to fill out the funding source section on the questionnaire, regardless of the protocol type. Now, um, so let me first show you the uh, NHSR protocol. If I have not human subjects research selected, and then go to the questionnaire, um, <clears throat> once I get to the questionnaire page, you'll see we have two different sections here. One is our human subjects research section, and the other is our HIPAA section. They're both marked as red and incomplete, and they also have a yellow star, because we wanted to have three different ways to make sure that they know to fill it out. Um, all the other fields currently are marked as not needed. So that's the way our um, NHSR is. That's all that's really required. Now, if I go back to the protocol tab here, and I change this selection to, let's say, exempt, then I go back to the questionnaire. Uh, by changing that, now you can see there's a much wider variety of things that need to be um, filled out. So um, the way it works is it's a real basic you know, waterfall logic. Answer yes, get more or less questions. Answer no, get more or less questions. So um, we'll go ahead and um, just fill out a no and test right here. So once I've actually finished this particular section, I've answered all the questions that have been asked of me, if I scroll to the bottom here and hit Save, um, <clears throat> once the document saves, you can see now that this is marked green and complete. So what we actually did was every time, and we encourage them to save after each um, section to avoid um, staying on the same page for too long and uh, having a session expire. So um, once they save each one, it not only keeps their session from expiring, it also keeps them um, sort of informed on how much of the questionnaire they've filled out. Um, now, as you can see, we've got funding source not needed. If I go back to um, protocol 
and I'm just going to add a sponsor funding source. Um, let's see, sponsor name. Let's see if I put health here. And we'll just use this sponsor and go ahead and add. Uh, once we've added a sponsor, if we go back to the questionnaire page, you'll see the sponsor section is now marked as incomplete. So it will actually start asking you questions. Now anything that's marked as not needed, you can see the questions in here, but you can't answer them. Most of the ones that are not needed uh, usually just have one question. Some of these full boards automatically start with more. So um, if you go back, change your protocol type to full board, you'll of course have to answer full board or expedited, so on and so forth. Um, so that's some of the customizations that we did with filling out the uh, protocol. Um, one of the other things that we did is there's a, a variety of different uh, attachments here that, uh, for instance, if I open the HIPAA section and I say, yes, it does involve protected health information, and then it says, please select one of the following HIPAA statements. So, um, and then after that it says uh, right here, a completed corresponding form must be attached in the notes and attachments page. Above and beyond just putting this indicator here at the end of the sentence, we also attached um, on submit validations for the questionnaire. So if somebody selects, uh, for instance, let's say a uh, waiver request form, then, and then we could say it, it involves no more, <clears throat> and then by hitting save it's going to update that. Um, and then if I go to submit, it's going to actually tell me that I need to um, upload this particular document. So on the notes and attachments page, what actually happens here is they have a long list of different attachment types that they can select. So what they'll do is they'll go to the corresponding HIPAA form, and it'll be the waiver of research authorization form, and they'll go and actually upload it. Um, once they've added a document that is labeled as this attachment type, we can't actually verify the contents of the document, but um, that's, you know, that's what the compliance office is for. Um, but we do have this particular form so that um, this validation so that they don't uh, you know, accidentally forget um, anything like that. And of course, there's another sort of double check that they can select. They can mark a attachment as incomplete, and the system will not allow them to uh, submit an incomplete attachment. So they'll simply just have to go back, check the attachment, and then remark it as complete, and then they can submit. So those are some of the details that we did with the questionnaire. Um, we don't really have any page level validations. Uh, for instance, those are, are validations in which if you add um, somebody, you know, if you add something to a protocol and you won't be able to leave the, the page. Um, I'll show you specifically for anybody who's not actually familiar with the page level validation. Um, one of the uh, easiest ones to do, if I add somebody as a co-investigator and attempt to leave the page, it's going to come back with uh, an error here and it points directly to it. Um, so you've got these different level of validations here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, add this so that I can move on. I have, a, I have a question for the questionnaire. Yes, absolutely. This is Matt from Cornell. Um, yes. I, I realize this question is a little bit on the um, the IRB process side rather than the technical side, but um, mm -hmm. just looking at the options you have, you have um, if someone said not human subject research, um, then the two documents that have to be completed are the um, the tab um, or the panel for not humans or human subject research, and then the HIPAA panel. Yes, and it seems to me that there's a potential for uh, a researcher to mistakenly answer not human subject research, but then have HIPAA data that could constitute um, human research. Do you have a logic um, process built into the questionnaire itself there, or do you leave that to the IRB administrator to evaluate and then resend back to the researcher if they've done that mistakenly? That would be up to the IRB administrator. I don't know of any way we could put a logic in there for that. Well, um, we did originally have a certain, on these first couple questions, um, if it was non-human subjects research, if they answer yes to all three of these questions, it automatically is not, not human subjects research. So we could put uh, a validation on there, essentially, you pick this protocol type, you answer these questions incorrectly, and we could, yeah. we could put a validation in there. Um, and essentially, we could put a validation on HIPAA that you know, if they were to answer yes to any of these, for one reason or another, that it probably wouldn't qualify, but... no. See, the reason we added the HIPAA was for de decedent research. 
and that's the only time that you would use HIPAA for an NHSR. We do have that. So we could put, I guess, a validation if they put anything other than decedent research. Right. It couldn't be NHSR. Right. We could do that. Yeah, we, we definitely have the potential to be able to do any of that. It just um, it wasn't uh, of our you know extreme highest priority to, to do any of that. And that's one of the things we had, um, especially from the first moment that we uh, implemented it, we had um, a lot of feedback from uh, researchers, reviewers, administrators, um, even you know technical people. Uh, so we, we really had a lot of feedback on this because um, previously, prior to KC, we had a much more static form of the questionnaire that we had um, a lot of things couldn't be changed. So we had a, a lot of um, you know more much more drastic changes uh, in this transition, a lot of things that had sort of been waiting in the queue. Hi, I have a hey, question. This is Rachel at MSU. Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Can you explain to us why um, you guys chose to write scripts um, as opposed to utilizing the maintenance tables? Oh, um, yeah, it, it was really a, a uh, essentially it was for uh, implementation purposes. We have four different um, instances that we use here at WVU. We have our sandbox, our development, our test, and our production instance. And actually, at one point, we had five, um, but we, we took that one back down. Um, but the, um, and we, we work with a lot of different um, entities, even different IT entities here at WVU. So um, the reason why we chose to use scripts is because um, it was much more, once we had a script, it was much easier to simply um, uh, generate a war file and then, and then deploy the code um, with, into the uh, instance that we wanted to use. Um, it was a huge time saver because as you can see, I mean, we have, if I expand all, I mean, we have a, a very significantly large amount of questions and these aren't even all of them. Um, so to, to actually have to go in and enter them each manually um, <clears throat> into, um, you know, KC would take a very long time. Now, in the newer version, I saw one of the enhancements they're coming out with is a, essentially an export and import function. And with that, uh, we would have probably just done it all through the front end, done an export, and then we could save it on our server so we had a backup. And at any point, uh, it would have been as simple as a point-and-click import. Um, that just didn't, we didn't have that functionality in this particular version. Mike, do you have an example of um, a question that allows you know, multiple answer values to be selected? Uh, multiple answers, you mean... Um, Actually, no. In, in this version of the questionnaire, the only question types we have are uh, radio buttons, drop downs, or text boxes. Um, in the newer versions of the questionnaire, it's with the advanced uh, business logic engine. From, this is just from what I've heard. Um, in RICE 2.0, there is um, different questions that are not just those three question types. Uh, but in this version that we're using, which I believe is 3.2, um, it only has those uh, question types available in the questionnaire. Also, was there some feedback or, or was there a reason that you chose to show even the questionnaires that are not required by the user? Um, yeah, I think the, uh, a lot of the idea behind that was if, um, and that's why we wanted to show them the questions as well, um, it would essentially help the um, the uh, protocol personnel, the, the PI, to go through and if they look and, you know, it's, it's easy to see if they've got a lot of questions that they're answering that seem to not have, not deal with their research, that'll be a, an indicator that they're probably doing the wrong thing. Uh, but if somebody picks NHSR, uh, we wanted to have, uh, have the availability for them to be able to look at the other questions that may be asked if they were to pick a different protocol type and uh, possibly help them as an indicator to figure out the proper um, type of review that would be required for what they're trying to do. Um, we really encourage our investigators to call our compliance office and just ask them uh, because it's much simpler. But uh, either way, we wanted to make it so that um, they could you know, pretty much see everything, but of course couldn't take action on it unless it was required. Um, any other questions about the questionnaire? Okay. Um, let's 
let's go ahead and move on to uh, number three. Any workarounds in our current system? Um, let's see. That's a, a very generalized statement. Um, we have uh, probably quite a few workarounds. I mean, uh, most of our workarounds are not necessarily, um, and not really things that KC can't do as much as um, things that either we just didn't have time to implement and we found a, an easier way to do it. Um, I think one of the most, um, actually I think the only one that really comes to mind is the way we set up our committees and the way we actually review protocols, which is pretty significant. Um, the one gap that we had found in this particular version, and I don't think this exists in the later versions, uh, but in this particular version, uh, 3.0 and, and now this version of 3.2, um, the, some of the uh, actions that you could take on a protocol, and these are actually going to show up here under unavailable actions, but um, some of the actions of grant exemption, um, some of the like expedited approval, uh, some of these other things, um, we found that initially they didn't create uh, correspondences. So what we actually did was we chose to run um, every protocol that comes into our office is actually run as a full board. And what I mean by that is it's not like we actually hold a meeting and we have reviewers or anything like that. Um, we, but it does go through the steps of assigning to a reviewer, assigning to an agenda, and taking a vote on the protocol. Now the vote is always just going to be zero because there's never anybody in attendance on any of these. And it's a workaround that we did and we will, I know, definitely have to change because one of our technical resources, um, Chuck Tharp, um, here at WVU, he's already told us that they've changed that so you can't put in a vote of zero for no. You can't hold uh, a meeting with no one in attendance, <clears throat> which makes sense, um, absolutely. But um, the reason why we did that is because we found the full board process to be um, very sufficient and um, we wanted to really train on the exact same way every time. So we found it that we could use that for every different type of protocol that came in and um, it would always generate a correspondence. And so, you have anything? Yeah, that was the big problem because for every exemption that we grant, there was no way to send out a letter and they need letters for an NHSR, the same thing. And uh, so we assigned them to the NHSR board or the exempt board, and which consists of me, hmm. <laughs> and we go ahead and approve it that way and can send out a letter. So here, for instance, we have our different boards here. We have a training board, which that was a workaround that we used to um, pretty much allow one of our IRB administrators here who specifically checks for um, training on protocols like city training and things like that um, to be able to uh, do their own sort of small review and they do that as a full board process and then send it back. That way they're, um, the things that they actually require from the um, PI or the, any of the investigators are captured in a correspondence letter. So essentially like uh, the NHSR board is, is the same thing. So if I go into view uh, the NHSR board um, we really only have, and if I go to members here, we really only have three members. We have our test member, uh, and really in our production system we only have two. It's Lilo and then our other reviewer here, Barb White. So those are the people, and really Lilo is the, she does pretty much all the NHSR protocols. Barb is there as a sort of backup if Lilo is not here. So um, that's one of the workarounds that we did. Every protocol that comes in goes through the steps of a full board. Um, minus the, um, you know, taking attendance, actually running a meeting, um, anything like that. Going in the uh, central admin, um, looking into, oh, I'm sorry, wrong one, looking into schedules. In a full board relationship, you would actually go in here, um, and I need to filter this actually by committee ID. Let's go gold board. So if I just search for the gold board and we want to hold a meeting, um, I can go ahead and this is our test system. So I can go in here and edit and this is actually where you would go in. You would look at the different protocols that were submitted. You would take attendance, go through the entire full board action. So there's a little bit more that we do for full boards, but everything else, um, we, we simulate everything except for navigating to the central admin tab and really holding the meeting. Um, in that respect, we got all the letters we needed. Uh, we really got all the functionality that we needed. 
And um, that was our main workaround instead of having to really design custom code to fit with having correspondence. But like I said, from what I've gathered, um, they've uh, you know, corrected any correspondence needs um, that uh, you know, exist in the later versions. And we have the same problem with amendments. We've had to put all the deviations of those events and other things into an amendment, mm -hmm. which is not what I wanted to do, but it seems to be the only way that we can create a correspondence to the PI. So that's the way we're handling them right now. I'm hoping that will change in the future. Yes. Yeah, we all are, honestly. Um, and that's it, most of our workarounds have really been because of our requirement of needing those correspondence letters and the specifics about what should be there and, and so on and so forth. So, Joseph, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the for the newest version, the correspondent do actually work for different type of protocol approval, right? Yes, Not I believe just it, for I, I you know I believe they do. Um, I okay. haven't specifically seen that, but I have heard that. So right, I'm uh, pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I would think that even in, in the version you have, you know, we would have had an approval, expedited approval correspondence, a full board approval correspondence, uh, but it sounds like that wasn't the case. Well, if that was the case, uh, when we were implementing it, we, uh, we, um, I didn't uh, impossibly uh, have the, uh, if, if anybody is having any issues, they might want to mute their uh, microphone. Um, we couldn't uh, figure out how to get those to generate a correspondence. Now, there's a lot of things that we really had to learn on, on the fly with this system. And so when it came to uh, a lot of these ways, there are probably different ways that we could have, have done with you know, more time or, or anything like that um, and investigated. And most of it was uh, finding a way that worked, finding a way that met all of our business requirements, and uh, essentially being able to train and continue on with our, our timeline that we were given. So there may have been additional functionality that we had never really um, broached, um, but this is the way that we were able to uh, to do it here at WVU. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about correspondence, uh, it, it's referring to the PDF that's generated on, on an action, right? Yes, yeah, actually generating a PDF with signatures and all that, uh, you know, generated from an XML file and, and everything. Mm -hmm. so. Mike? Yes. Okay. So um, I know uh, West Virginia always wanted to not restrict only assign reviewer, um, how to say that? All the review, active reviewer for one committee can actually go into protocol and leave comments, yes. um, not restricted to just assign. Right. So do you have any workaround for that? Yes, they will send them all to me. They can all review the protocol. And if they have any comments, they would send it to me, and I can put them in there since oh, I have access. Okay. So well, it's like going through email communication then? Yeah. There's actually okay. more, than, there's more than one way because we can do the tertiary. Yeah, um, but uh, I don't like that idea because everybody gets a notification and that's not good. Right. Um, I don't want to do that. So what we did was uh, another thing that we did, but it, it generates well, – right now I don't know if we can actually differentiate the different – primary, secondary, tertiary on notifications. Um, that's, that's one of the things, I mean, as far as notifications, we're, we're still customizing that. Right now we're doing manual notifications um, because of uh, one or two issues that actually have nothing to do with Kuali. Um, specifically, it has to do with uh, our implementations in our database and a lot of other things that go well over my head, but um, many different things that we've been, been using. But one of the things that I had set up and um, I don't know if I'll be able to remember where this is right off the top of my head, uh, but the uh, reviewer, I think it's the protocol reviewer type. There we go. Um, <clears throat> originally, it's just primary and secondary, uh, but what we made is to a third type, which is a tertiary reviewer, uh, to be able to do that. But Lilo is correct. Currently, the way it's set up, um, is that anybody we assign as a tertiary reviewer, they are going to automatically get a notification. And um, over notifications is one thing that had plagued WVU from on a variety of different um, programs that have been used here. So um, that's one thing they're very sensitive to. We want to make sure that we 
have the notifications designed exactly how we need to. So um, the other workaround is something that we had talked about, which is essentially making them all viewers, and that's where Lilo had talked about, so that they can go in and view it, and then they would just communicate with her, and then she would um, put that on there. So there's um, a couple of different ways. We may probably, uh, I think we would probably use the tertiary option if we can do a couple of things like set defaults for um, when a protocol is assigned to have a specific amount of tertiaries, and then of course custom, uh, customizing the notifications to make sure that they only go to primary and secondary uh, and not really to the tertiary. So once we have that, we can probably use this tertiary option, but as we're doing it now, it is a, a sort of email communication workaround, yeah. So are they using the online review uh, document? Are reviewers using that to send in the review comments and attachments? Yes, the primary and secondaries are. Any tertiary reviewers that want to make their own comments, mm -hmm. um, we can do really one of two things. They can contact Lilo and Lilo can put them in for them, or Lilo can actually go through and assign them as another reviewer, and then they will actually have, um, she can actually go choose this tertiary reviewer, and then it will, in, in essence, once we have it turned on, send them a notification, and they'll be perfectly okay with that because they would have already requested it. And then they'll, they'll be on the online review tab and be able to submit their own online review, yes. So, so in your current business process, is there a need for one reviewer to see other reviewers' comments? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is there a, is there a need for one reviewer to see another reviewer's uh, review comments? I want them to see each other's reviewers' comments, yes. So how are, how are they doing it today? Are they looking at the submission details, or did you make some changes to allow them to do that? Um, in the online review, when I go in and see that, I can see everybody's comments. Well, you're an administrator. Yeah, um, I don't know. Actually, I'm, I'm not certain on that one because that's one um, we've really only had. We haven't had any full boards actually go through, although we are live with them. We haven't used any in the system yet. Um, we've had one created but not actually submitted. We've had uh, quite a few um, or probably two or three expedited and, and countless exempts in NHSRs because uh, we've been live with those for months. So... Um, that may be uh, a gap that we need to, to look into. Um, either way... Uh, I didn't know it was a question. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm not sure either. So um, that may be something that we have to, uh, to investigate further. But yeah, we would like for them to be able to see each other's comments. Um, and uh, apparently we have a test case that we would need to add. So. Yes. Joseph, can't they see those comments after we um, click that button in the agenda to make it Visible. Can I think? Yeah. You're... Once, once the admins, once you know, uh, the administrator accepts the review comments, um, that's when you know the review comments do become available okay. in, in the submission details and through the schedule if they set the schedule to available. I, I was just thinking in the course of the review if there was a you know if there was a business need and if West Virginia did some customization around it. Okay. Got it. Yep. Doing the online comments. Right. Right. <clears throat> All right. Um, this is Rachel from MSU again. Yeah. Can you tell us um, when your actual implementation, implementation date was and how many of the various types of protocols you've had go through the system? All right. Um, it's a tough one off the top of my head. Our original implementation was quite a few months ago. July? Probably, yeah, probably July. The NHSRs, we started slowly with NHSRs. Right. We, yeah. we did a slow rollout and a slow transition from one system to the other. We're actually still running both systems in parallel right now. Um, we did the NHSRs first, and we did those for a time with a month and a half, two months, something like that. Right. And then we uh, implemented exempts. And this most recent rollout was it's probably less than a month yeah. ago, right? Yeah. And, um, Thanksgiving, around Thanksgiving, yeah. Yeah, um, and then we've had a couple of expedited since then, and uh, I don't believe we've had, I know we haven't have had any full boards submitted. We may have had a few, um, you know, created and saved, uh, but nothing that's actually been submitted yet. Um, any other uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, you you folks had 
uh, reported some performance problems uh, earlier on. Are, are those still in existence, or and how did you solve them, if not? Um, actually, they are they are not in existence now. Um, I really uh, Dave Dufala is pretty much was the lead on this, and he did an excellent job with uh, resolving this issue. What um, what it ended up happening was something uh, in the system was causing, and uh, we're, we're still not sure of the cause, but we do know what was happening. Um, what was essentially happening was there was a, a select few users, uh, by no fault of their own, that um, had somehow um, been given a derived role uh, by the system. And I think it had to do with when we upgraded, we're not sure, um, exactly, but it may have had to do with um, something that had happened internally here at WVU when we upgraded from um, 3.0 to 3.2. And um, like I said, we're not exactly sure of the cause, but what was happening was um, those particular people were getting added to uh, each protocol um, as, the, for instance, like the PI or some of the uh, particular you know, derived roles uh, that exist in the system. Uh, IRB Online Reviewer was actually one that was happening as well. There was a couple of different roles. but um, So they would continually uh, be adding uh, more and more throughout, and they would, once uh, they, pretty much once the corruption point had happened with a single particular user, they would start to get added onto all these other protocols. Uh, the difficulty in it for us was <clears throat> we had hid a lot of the permissions on the permissions page. Um, we really just left viewer and aggregator to really simplify it. Uh, because we didn't need a lot of other options for permissions. We actually uh, decided that it was uh, more dangerous to keep those there for the, um, the uh, protocol personnel to be able to edit. So um, some of these roles that were actually getting duplicated, we would have been able to see on that particular page. Um, but because we hid them, we didn't know. And it took a lot of scouring in our database and really realizing, because it was only a performance issue on the initial save. Every subsequent subsequent save was instantaneous. Um, and as you can see in our test system today, there was no delay. I mean, it was pretty much, you know, two-second save, which is pretty much what we deal with. Each, each save is in the two to three-second range. Um, so, but they were getting to the point where they would, once they would start, it would progressively get worse and worse until eventually it would get to the six or seven minute range for the uh, initial time, the initial save time, and then it would just time out. So we get to the point where people couldn't create protocols. Now, it never got that bad in our production system, but we did notice it early in our development system. And um, before it really became an issue in our production system, we had implemented fixes to clear out those tables. And now we have, um, until we really fix the root of the issue, we have sort of a, a, a Band-Aid of sorts in place to um, a scheduled job to run and check for all the roles to make sure roles aren't continually being added uh, at the wrong times. And if they are, we have uh, a way to actually go and clear out those tables so that it doesn't cause any, any sort of clutter or anything like that. Thanks. Glad sure. to hear you resolved that. <laughs> oh, trust me. We're all glad to hear we resolved that here at WVU because it was, <laughs> it was stressing us out uh, big time. But, um, and it slowed us down by weeks. Yeah, it, it really did because we, we put everything uh, on a halt to really put an all-out investigation on it, um, and it was, it was really very difficult, and um, it was such a broad spectrum of things to look at. We have a, a very um, difficult and I would say even convoluted, maybe that's not the right word, but a very complex uh, setup here, um, most of which I don't understand as far as the hardware because I'm not a part of our systems group, but we have two or three and sometimes even four different groups that are all involved in one way, shape, or form. So the orchestration of something that large is, uh, was very difficult. Um, but it looks to be as something uh, within our database, and it could have possibly been caused by one of our upgrades. So. This is Matt at, at Cornell. Um, mm -hmm. got a, you can answer this as briefly as you like. Um, okay. I'm worried it might be a bit of a big question right at the end of our time. Um, so you're, you've rolled out uh, soft rollout, uh, administrative review procedures um, for simpler projects. I'm, I'm curious to know at least um, either what, you, what you're in the works of developing or what you're thinking about um, doing for uh, management of you know, applications that will have a number of 
attachments that might need to go with them. So, for instance, if we have, say, a large study that is going to be a, um, you know, a medical study that is going to involve drug brochures, uh, um, child assent and parental permission forms, HIPAA authorization forms, et cetera, mm -hmm. what's your thinking about how that information is going to be provided and reviewed and commented upon uh, within the system here? Um, well, as far as the um, let's go, uh, let's see. As far as the system is concerned, it, it really uh, does really everything that um, that we would need here. Oh, of course, I don't have it in the most recent list. Um, the um, all the different uh, notes and attachments here, and I'll just go over a real basic thing here. Um, all the different notes and attachments are, are really all there. Um, one of the options that's listed there for for anybody who doesn't know. There is a, a filtering option when it comes to a uh, large amount of attachments that really allows you to <clears throat> um, view everything uh, in a much easier way. Um, <clears throat> and now, of course, there we go. All right, so the, the protocol attachments. Um, once you've actually added an attachment, and I'll just go and find a, a basic uh, attachment here, and let's add a description. So <clears throat> once they're added onto the protocol, there is this right here, which allows you to go through, select the different attachment types, and you can actually filter by those attachment types. So for instance, if you have 30 attachments on a protocol and you just want to see, say, the advertisements, and say there's a couple different advertisement methods, you can actually filter, and it'll only show you those advertisements. And then from there, you can show uh, those particular pieces. Um, so that's, that's a way that we really train the reviewers to be able to, to see those different things. Um, above and beyond that, um, it's mainly just on um, training issues. I mean, most of, of all the um, uh, functionality that we've found uh, that we've needed is all there. And this filtering option allows you to, to really sort of uh, filter out one form or another, um, you know, just to be able to give you a, an easier way to view. Okay. So then from, from the reviewer's perspective, the, I assume that there's a, um, a, a list of attachments that have been included with a um, yeah. No, when you open it up, when you go up there to show, it lists each attachment separately, and you go into the show for each one, and it opens it up. Okay. Um, so uh, again, to the complex application, if if you have a number. Yeah. Of if you have a lot of. Yeah. Do, I mean, is there a mechanism that there. that helps acknowledge whether it's been viewed, or um, is it just kind of as best you can, um, it's the list um, and, the, and the reviewer should try to remember well, where no, they are. Well, that's an idea. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> no, as far as I know, I don't think there is one. No. Um, one other no. place that you can go is under the protocol actions and the summary and history. In the summary section, it will give you a basic overview, and you can actually see um, each of them listed um, here under attachments. Okay. And then you can view them right okay. from the screen. That's great. That's great. I but mean, yeah, I realize that this isn't... It's essentially a list form. It could, it could be very similar. You know, if, if, if you get a stack of papers, you don't necessarily remember which ones you've looked at. So, right. Um, you know, uh, everybody can create their sort of offline mechanism, but it would be neat mm -hmm. if there was a just a radial button thing. It, it know, would be nice if you could put some sort of a check mark or right, something. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, just a thought. It shows that you've looked at it, yeah. <laughs> Especially if there's 12 advertisements like we have often enough, mm -hmm. and maybe four or five consent forms and asset forms. Right. It's an idea, yeah. All right. Yeah. Enhancement. I like there it. Yes. <laughs> I wrote it down already. All okay. right. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, well, I mean, we're, I, I think we're probably about at time. I don't know if, Wayman, if you want to call it, or you want to take more questions. I mean, um, I'm free to, to talk if you guys are, um, but uh, I don't want to run anybody over. So. Did we cover everything on her list? Yeah. Uh, what was the last one? Customization. Any customization code. Uh, as far as code, I won't really be able to, to help you with that. That's all on our, our technical resource. Mike Brent, I'll have to yell at him and figure out where he was. So. So can, um, let me ask you my last question. Sure. So overall speaking, um, when you roll out this training to your PI, what is the feedback? They enjoy it. They love the system. They think it's much easier to use than our old system. And the feedback has been very positive. Good. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we really tried to, we spent a lot of time um, really trying to design this for the researcher to make it easier on them. Uh, unfortunately for Lilo and the gang here, um, we didn't get enough time to really, in our first implementation, to, to spend, to really make it as efficient behind the scenes as we did for all the different customizations that we spent on the researcher. But, right. um, but this way we only have to hear Lilo and Barb complain instead of all the researchers <laughs> complain. <true. laughs> um, so, but no, they, they really do uh, seem to enjoy it. The only uh, downfall which has nothing to do with KC is just that um, they couldn't port over all their old protocols from our yeah. old system to the new one. Um, uh, whether KC would support that or not is, is irrelevant because I guarantee you our system would not. So. Overall, how much time did you take for the implementation? Oh, um, before our first go live, uh, to be honest, with without the performance issue, we probably would have shaved off an extra five months. Yeah. Um, but I would say we probably spent about um, a little over a year, I think, uh, getting everything set up. And I don't think a lot of it, um, to be honest, there's probably more than I'd, I'd care to mention was. Um, you know, just a lot of the formalities of, of how everything's set up and how difficult it is sometimes to get certain things to, you know, go a certain way, especially if you have a lot of different groups all working together. Um, there, there are always going to be inherent inefficiencies um, with that many people working on one, one project. But overall, I think we really did um, a pretty good job here at WVU, especially for the amount of resources that we have. Um, I think uh, as far as our, our IT units, you know, uh, we really only have, I think, uh, six or seven different people that are, um, you know, full full time for this particular project. Um, you know, this is just from our research office, and then even the compliance office only really has, you know, three or four. Well, yeah, I guess two. we count two, and then three if you count Jonathan. So, um, so yeah, overall we have, uh, you know, I would say arguably limited resources, but I think we did really well. Um, we, and like I said, overall year and a half, uh, just over a year. Well, we spent months working on the questionnaire, coming in here in this room two or three times a yeah. week for an hour to three hours every time, uh, bashing out the wording to the questionnaire and how we would set it up and the logical, you know. How it would flow and everything. Yeah, how yeah. it would flow. It was <clears throat> a and, lot of work. And, and, and like I said, from our previous system, it was the questionnaire was very static. So there, were, there had been literally years of changes that needed to be implemented all at the same time. And so yeah. that was a, a whole backlog of work that we really had to implement when it came to this system. You may have already mentioned it, but can you tell us what was your legacy system? Um, our legacy system is a, a system called Brain or Bran, depending on how you Brain. want to pronounce it. Brain. It never uh, was some Brand. people say that. They don't know how to talk. Um, anyway, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's Brain. It's, it's Brain 2, and it came from Baylor, Texas. Yeah. And we bought it, and we were really very happy with it, but they went bankrupt. The uh, the spelling is B R A A N. Yes, is how it's spelled. And um, yeah, it's shortly after uh, they implemented it here at WVU, the company went bankrupt, and um, we were able to keep on uh, one particular person who was a resource to be able to help with maintenance and everything. Um, but it had become you know very very lacking, very slow, everything like that. So it was. Definitely. I mean, that's really uh, a lot of what really uh, encouraged us to go first with the human compliance module. Right, because the system doesn't talk to any browsers. It was set up for Internet Explorer 6. six, six yeah. yeah. And so it doesn't talk to the browsers anymore. Everybody mm -hmm. was complaining, and there wasn't a thing we could do about it. Yeah. And we can't update it, and so we, it's just more and more problems. Right. Yeah, sorry, real quick question. Uh, this is Dan from UC Davis. Just a question yeah. in, the, in the conversion. I know you said the migration didn't go very well or didn't work at all. No. How then, did you have the research team or research community entering data, um, new data into KC, or did you have a research in the IRB? We doing talked it? about it for a long time and decided that every time, uh, whenever there would be a new activity on a protocol that was already existent and approved in the other system, they would have to enter the full protocol in KC. Yeah. <clears throat> with the amendment or change or whatever. Right. So that it was fresh and clean and complete in the new system. 
And if it didn't require any sort of change, it could continue to stay in the old system. And uh, you know, we'd pretty much run it in sort of like an archive mode um, once we move fully to KC. But like I said, currently we're running them both in parallel, but we're encouraging all new protocols to go into KC, although the legacy system is still being used. OK, great. Thank you. Sure. We thought about having them just attach and use it as a, a skeleton protocol you know, attach the old protocol as an attachment, and then in KC just put in a skeleton protocol. And the boards talked about it a long time, and they decided that that wouldn't be the best way to go. So we determined not to do that. Mm -hmm. This is Catherine from UC Davis. I have a question about the reporting. My understanding is the foundation didn't release much in the way of reporting. What have you guys done? Um, what specific reports have you guys put together so that um, you have something to sort of, I guess, demonstrate that, that KC is really working for you? Um, um, to be honest, um, our reporting expert is Dave Dufala, and he's been working with that um, you know, pretty intensely. Um, I, I will tell you the most recent one that um, that he's done, which actually Lila doesn't even know about this yet, but he was customizing um, the different uh, questions from the questionnaire when it came to expedited or exempt category of review. Um, they require that at every board meeting they have all the previous um, expedited and exempt protocols that have been approved since the last board meeting mm -hmm. to be uh, brought up. And one of those things is we needed um, reporting from inside the, um, the questionnaire and everything like that. Um, unfortunately, I can't say a lot about it because, um, yet again, I will um, kind of point to some of the uh, possible inefficiencies in the infrastructure here, but it took us um, a very long time to get production database access um, for our system uh, from our actual <coughs> systems group to get to our research office IT group. Um, so we haven't had a whole lot of of time or experience to really, um, you know, mess with the uh, the routing features, but it's something that we've really now that we have uh, production access. And this is literally within the last couple of weeks. Um, now that we have that, we'll be able to really customize a lot of these, and we've already started gathering different ones that we um, we want to do that with. So hopefully by the next subcommittee meeting or maybe the the following one, um, I'll really have a lot more to to be able to comment on that. Okay, any more questions for Mike? Okay, so thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lilo. You're, You're doing welcome. such a great job. I just have to schedule you for another demo. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sure. Sure. No problem. Okay, and then so after the recording is done, then it w I will send out to everyone the, um, the uh, link to the recording, so you can always go back and listen to it. And then um, our next um, RB sub meeting will subcommittee meeting will be on January eight. And um, anything else, Joseph? No, I think you covered it all. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> thanks, Lilo. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank Hi. You. Hi. 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 Yes. <laughs> I have to stop recording. Okay. Do you um and do I have to do anything above and beyond that? Um, I don't. Do think I need so. to send you anything? Okay. Yeah. All Thank right. You. I'm gonna go. All right. No problem. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Please stand by.